Hello, I'm Maxine Mawinney and welcome to Dateline London. This week we'll be discussing the events of 2014 and trying to put some sort of perspective on the past year. To discuss all of this, my guests this week are Janet Daly of the Sunday Telegraph, Marc Roche of France Le Soir, Nabila Ramdani, the Algerian writer and broadcaster, and Stryker Maguire from Bloomberg Markets. Welcome to all of you. So let's begin here in the UK. Now, we had a referendum in Scotland, UKIP's emergence onto the scene, and polls seemingly unchanged across the year, giving Labour approximately a seven-point lead over the Tories. So, Janet, uh, let's start with you. What are your thoughts on all of this over the past 12 months? Well, I don't think the poll lead for Labour really means an awful lot. Uh, when people are asked who they see as the more credible Prime Minister, and particularly who they trust more with the economy, it's Cameron and the Tories. So I don't think that the Labour lead, I think the Labour lead is kind of a, a fiction. But what does come out clearly from the polls is that nobody likes anybody very much, especially in the major parties. And that has been the phenomenon of this past year politically. The major political parties, what you could call the Westminster establishment or the Westminster club, has been grotesquely, hideously unpopular. And the result has been the rise of UKIP, of the SNP in Scotland, of the Greens even, um, and the total collapse of the Lib Dems, who, be, who were the protest party, the dustbin party, the party you went to to object to everybody else. But now that they're, they've been pulled into the culpability of the coalition, they are probably finished for a generation, at least, if not forever. So what happens in the election is actually, I'm going to say this perversely, uh, going to be less surprising in terms of previous history. It, I, I think actually going out on something of a limb here, uh, that there will be a workable Tory majority, that there won't be a coalition. The only possible coalition would be Labour SNP, which would be quite a nightmare for most English voters. Uh, and the SNP is actually further left than Labour. But I don't think that's going to happen, primarily because... Ed Miliband is not a credible figure as Prime Minister. Mark, Mark you're twitching here. Come in. <laughs> well, it's typical <laughs> telegraph propaganda I'm hearing. Basically, I believe there will be a Labour victory because basically the Tories are not a very popular party and the Lib Dem, as Janet says, the only point I agree with her, um, are nowhere. So it will be left versus right, traditional um, British election. And the Labour will win because people are worried about the NHS Maybe the economy is doing well. They don't feel it. They, there's a feeling that the rich are getting richer, the poor are getting poorer, the middle class is squeezed. So I would think, despite the fact that Miliband did not have a good year, and he has been lampooned, basically, I think, because uh, the uh, press on the right has been really at him, but basically, it will be a Labour small majority. OK, Stryker, what about the rise of these other parties? Well, I think that, in a way, that, I think, is the most interesting thing about what happened this year, is that, is that the, the Alex Salmon phenomenon, the uh, Nigel Farage phenomenon, they're both about the sort of anti-politics movement in this country. And one of the things about the leaders of the, of the big parties is that neither of them is a towering figure or towering enough to kind of counteract this really strong disaffection from politics. The other thing is that the, the economy in some ways does look very good. It certainly looks good compared to, shall we say, that country just across the channel. Yeah, exactly. Um, yes. But, but yeah. there is country across the channel. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, but there are, the there are really, there are fundamental problems with the, with the British economy. The current account deficit is, is huge. It's in percentage terms, it's about four times what it is in the United States and just in percentage, in, as a percentage of GDP. This is something that somebody at some point has to fix because it can't go on, as you can see what happened in Russia. Not that, not that Britain is as, in as bad a shape as Russia. Oh, thank you very much. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Nabila, what about the um, disaffection of the public is what we're hearing for both the politicians and the politics at the moment? Well, I think you're spot on. I think January uh, 2014 can very much be viewed as a year of protest. But the British public generally doesn't take huge risk when it comes to general election time. And I think that's why, you know, we've seen, um, you've, we've seen issues like nationalism, which were huge over the past year, and uh, a lot of people letting off steam and many voting for an independent Scotland and indeed for UKIP. Mm. But I think the major issue in May 
for the general elections will be the economy, as it always is during general elections. It doesn't, this doesn't mean that we, people, you know, UKIP won't get a lot of votes. I think they've clearly touched a nerve with, you know, many, uh, especially from working class backgrounds. But I think the Conservatives' best chances of winning an overall majority will be their continuing economic success. Mm -hmm. I think Ed Miliband has uh, his problem is that he has become synonymous with metro with a metropolitan elite rather than the politics of ordinary people. And I think the Labour Party really needs to get back to its yeah. core message. Mm -hmm. I think but, well, this is an is, identity crisis for the Labour Party as much yes. as anything. And I think that will become clear after the general election. There is the Islington Labour Party. There's the metropolitan sort of left liberal li Labour Party, and there is the old. Labour and Party there working is. class Cameron roots. is not yeah. a man of the people. Oh, no, no, no. He, he did That's right. Eaten, but uh, nobody expects. No, hang on. In nobody in Hill and, uh, nobody in the expects. Shires, no, nobody expects the yes, Tories but, to be that. Yeah. But Labour's core vote depends very much on the feeling that they identify with working class people. And the next least popular leader they've ever had in term electoral terms is Neil Kinnock, but who at least looked plausible. He was a working class Welsh guy. You know, a very decent sort of had his political instincts. His head screwed on politically. Miliband is the child of Marxist yeah, academics yeah, and that's what class, it looks like. I think the they, British uh, working class also has defected the Tories, you know, the famous Thatcher uh, well, that, uh, well, coalition. That wasn't so much they defect, they don't want them. Yeah, that wasn't so much working class. That was C1, C2s. That was kind of lower middle class. It's, and in it's interesting, though, that all of you are passionate about the personalities involved in this. Nabila, why, uh, why do you think that is? Well, I think because, you know, it's it's fundamental. I think, you know, that the message sent by a leader is very, is very important indeed. And as far as the Labour Party is concerned, people need to hear from Ed Miliband that it is the party that sent for social justice and indeed public service. And you hear a lot about people saying Ed Miliband needs to surround himself but with real people rather than professional mm -hmm. politicians. Mm -hmm. And I think it's going to be very difficult for him, especially mm -hmm. considering that there's only five months until yeah. the election. Yeah. But if he sends the right messages across, and we need to hear more about welfare and immigration from him as well, then it's not impossible. But he needs to, you know, get a grip now. The reason yeah. I think personalities matter uh, in a sense, it, uh, not necessarily in the sort of American sense of it, uh, th where it matters quite a bit, but here, it, if you take the rising political stars, Farage and 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 Salmon, as who's now moved into a kind of a different mode, but their their personalities work because they reflect, I think, the mm. the something way something real, something mm. real yeah. in the There's people. There's an authenticity about that. That's right. Yeah. It may not it may not last. I mean, if you yeah. compare. UKIP, for example, to the Tea Party in the United States. What's happened to the Tea Party in the United States is that it's been absorbed mm -hmm. into the mainstream. And what's happened here is that the Farage phenomenon has pushed Labour and the Tories mm -hmm. to the right. Yeah. But it's not just right. It's not a question of right versus left. It's a question of sounding like real people, sounding like somebody you could talk to in a bus queue. I mean, the trouble with the Westminster establishment is they're all talking to each other all the time. Reflecting now, real people's mm, concerns. Yeah, but, yeah. Th but in the language that they understand. Yeah. There is now a professional club of politicians who talk like nobody on earth. Nobody talks like mm. that in the pub. And that's the appeal of Nigel well, Farage. when I hear you know, Farage, so it makes me absolutely disgusted. Yeah, the way yeah, he no, 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 attacks it's European. It's not a question of his opinions. He, it's a question of his a personality piece. and style. And you support a nasty okay. Oh, no, I don't support him. <laughs> on that, on that <laughs> note, we're going to move on to have another look back at another major story throughout the year at the Middle East. And uh, Nabila, with the rise of IS, it's been a terrible year, hasn't it? Well, uh, there's absolutely no doubt that it's been an appalling year for the Middle East. And uh, I think horrifying is one of the words that has been regularly used to describe developments uh, ranging from the ongoing civil war in Syria to the continuing implosion uh, of Libya. And even Egypt, a country which was viewed as the epicenter of the 2011 revolutions, is now in a terrible situation, you know, with effectively yet another military junta in charge. And the emergence of um, the self-styled uh, Islamic State, IS, uh, in the, world's, uh, the world community's imagination, if you, if you like, sums up the disastrous uh, situation. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, I've often dis said that they come out 
they come straight out of Hollywood, uh, you know, central casting, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a nihilistic, uh, black-clothed, uh, savage movement which stands for nothing except for destruction and death. And I, I think it has to be pointed out that they didn't exist before the US-led invasion of 2003, so it has a lot to do with the rise of such extremism. But I think foremost among the disasters was also the ongoing Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And we talk about nihilism as regards IS, but the way in which Israel went into the blockaded Gaza Strip over the summer all over again, uh, blowing up as many civilians and, and as many buildings as possible, was horribly cynical. And Israel seems to be perfectly happy with prosecuting an asymmetrical war against occupied Palestinians and carrying out absolute carnage. Um, and of course, Hamas rockets, you know, have to be condemned. Uh, they've killed six civilians uh, during the summer. But to punish an entire population in Gaza, uh, killing over uh, nearly 2,200 people, including more than 500 children, was, absolute, uh, was absolutely barbaric. Strike, I want to bring you in here, mm. particularly on the, the role of the United States and the backstory to IS. Well... One of the things about what's going on in, that, in the region is what can you do? What do you do? You, uh, so the United States and Britain invaded Iraq. We saw what that did. I mean, it, it exacerbated all the tensions that were there beforehand, and it's left the place a mess. The United States tried to do as little as possible in Libya, but other countries stepped in and look and look at Libya. We're, nobody's interfering in a sense in in Syria, and look what's happening yeah. there. So what? What's the what, solution? There is. I, mean, I, I I don't think there is a solution except history. It's a solution that no one seems to be able to come up with. Well, and, and, and the rest of the world is struggling. I agree with my two colleagues. Have said 100 percent. Simply, I find the bombings that the coalition is doing at least is stopping ISIS. One very worrying thing for me, 2014 is also the year of the foreign jihadists. Mm -hmm. All these young people of France, Britain, uh, Belgium, etc., mm -hmm. are going to fight for dates, like the International Brigade, except in Spain, in the war, but except they are siding with Franco, because that's what they, mm -hmm. they are not democratic. And, uh, and this is terrible, that uh, these affected youth, Muslim, badly integrated, suffering racism, is choosing that... Uh, and, and why is it, do you think, Janet, is it because of the way the, their own particular countries are facing these, no, I, um, don't, I suppose, I don't think difficulties? Death cults have always had a mysterious attraction for the young, particularly young males. Um, there's a Bader-Meinhof element in this, you know, that isn't really to do even with the particulars of the Middle Eastern situation, or it isn't even political specifically. But I do think that the glamour of what seems to be a successful nihilistic movement like ISIS has an appeal that will have to be destroyed, have to be undermined, and it can only be undermined by absolute mortifying defeat. And when that defeat looks to be on the cards, the attraction will vanish, it will mm. evaporate. I think that problem will disappear. The question is, as Stryker was saying, what is the solution? If you intervene, you get a mess. If you fail to intervene, you get a mess. The, the failure of America to intervene in Syria was really the immediate precipitating factor. Before, between, you know, There was a great deal of moral justification of what ISIS or ISIL is doing on the basis that the Syrian regime is being allowed to gas children. You know, the, the the failure of Obama to live up to his promise about red lines left a vacuum which allowed a possibility for uh, an even more nihilistic movement than al-Qaeda. Mm. But there is no right thing to do in this case. Everybody is playing it by ear. And, the, and I'm afraid that Washington, the White House at the moment, seems to be pursuing a, a quite cynical raison d'etat sort of view, you know, what is good for America in the immediate short term is what matters, and really not taking into account any long-term or medium-term foreign policy. Uh, well, what's going to be the answer, Nabila? Well, well, I think, as Jenna just said, I don't think that the, the White House, which is, let's face it, you know, the world's superpower, uh, ha doesn't have a foreign policy, and certainly not a consistent one. And as we've seen, sometimes it takes two people, ordinary people, uh, calling for change or taking to the streets to press, to put pressure on their own governments to try and, and sort things out. As far as, you know, beyond the carnage in Gaza, I think what we've really seen is that um, 
uh, people around the world are now rallying in a manner which we have never seen before mm -hmm. really and they are certainly sending the message that enough is enough and I don't think you know that people are no longer accepting that firing rockets unpleasant as it is is justification for occupation subjugation and the mass murder of innocent civilians so striker what more talks more negotiation What's going to take? Well, you, can, you know, you can't be against talks and negotiation. So, yeah, sure. But it, again, it's worrisome. There's also the fact that the United States is going through going through something now in the early stages that Britain, Britain has been going through for over 50 years, which is decline of empire. I mean, the the United States is is the only superpower, but it's still it's a diminished superpower. Uh, and and when that happens, you have you sort of you turn inward which i think is always dangerous and then sort of nationalist nativist feelings begin to infect the politics of the day so you you end up actually stymied and you end up with a lack of mobility. America has always had an isolationist tendency. It's yeah. recurred repeatedly throughout its history. And it's always been a reluctant colonialist. America has always been a reluctant imperial power. So any excuse, really, for pulling away from the right. world yes. is welcome. And I'm afraid Obama has taken all the excuses, and as a result, he's left a terrible void. And I think the way Russia behaved in Ukraine is part of this as well. If you leave a vacuum, somebody else will step in. Absolutely. Mm. Okay, uh, I think we should move on again to our third topic, and of course, the US, Russia, and Europe. And particularly, I think, Stryker, one of the most recent stories of 2014, the US relationship with Cuba. Yeah, that, I mean, that, that is a, uh, it's very easy to understand. For everybody to understand, it it, it seems uh, to to the vast majority of people the absolutely correct thing to do. Uh, it ends 53 years of a failed policy. Uh, having said that, it it is also quite symbolic. I mean, Obama uh, as president has executive powers, but they're not supernatural. Uh, so the embargo Sometimes exists. Sometimes they are. <laughs> <laughs> the embargo exists. And and uh, uh, it may take it may take years. It may take a, 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 another democratic administration at least mm. for that to be. But to the be significance lifted. of it's, what happened this year. It's well, it, 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 it's very important, um, and it it's it's especially important again for uh, the Americas. I mean, Cuba has been this the, the, this you know it's it's the it's a not a big country, but it's not a small country. It's close to America, and so and it was it was the one of the last vestiges of the of the Cold War. The mm -hmm. irony is is that is that, is that as that relationship is n normalized to a certain point, the relationship with Russia, formerly the Soviet <laughs> Union, is back in the chiller again. Yeah. For, well, we always thought that Russia's aggression was to do with communism, that it was an ideological thing. It's obvious that it wasn't. It was always just plain old-fashioned territorial yeah. aggression. You know? yeah. But Cuba was the sort of last 20 seconds of Stalinist Soviet empire. And it, I mean, it, it, Obama's had his Nixon in China moment. You know, and he wants that to be his legacy, uh, you know, as opposed to all this ignominious stuff that has constituted his foreign policy. But I don't see how. I mean, the Cubans are now free to sell cigars to Americans. They are free, you know, to do trade which will benefit their very corrupt sort of communist class at the top. It will end up looking remarkably like the old Batista regime, you know, where you'll get a few very rich plutocrats there is at the top. There's already the prostitution is still Absolutely. Is already and, and the there. drug trafficking and the as drug well. Trafficking. And so how does this benefit the Cuban people exactly? Are they going to be free to leave? Are they going to be free to come to Florida Use without the being internet? killed? Yeah, or, or to use the internet. I mean, I this is a, this. I think this is a quite cynical ploy to give him a place in history that doesn't look totally ignominious. Well, I think I think it, for him, this is part of an unfinished agenda. You know, he unstarted. Well, no, no, no. no he has, <laughs> this, I actually would disagree with that because I think he's had a pretty good year. Uh, when you look at what he's done on immigration. Now, you may not agree with him on immigration, but when you look at what he's done, this is this is real politics at its, you know, at its epitome. I mean, that's that is a that's again, he's limited as to what he can do. But what he did is quite significant. Obamacare, the much maligned Affordable Care Act, uh, as it turns out, six and a half million Americans have signed up to it. 
I think most of that, them for Medicare. Yeah. Well, yes, but Medicare existed before. <laughs> exactly. Right? But, yeah. Exactly. But still, but still, it got a lot of people onto Medicare no, who didn't know they were eligible. Symbolically, this is important. I mean, maybe you can send him to Europe. We need him now. Yeah. As yeah, a new you, nation. What, because, help, what, what help could he give Europe? So France, because you. in <laughs> Europe was a terrible year to speak about the mm. Middle East. It was not as bloody in Europe, but we had this rise of the right wing everywhere in Europe, except in the south where you have the rise of the, the left, left wing. wing. Yeah. You have, we are back on economic crisis. Greece, yeah. Greece is now again in trouble. But ask there yourself will be why, Mark? No, 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 no. I just why. consider, and Juncker... It's not his fault. No, no, no. Sure. And, he, and he Monsieur, the people Monsieur Juncker, the new president of the commission, <laughs> is completely into a scandal of tax the evasion in his own yeah. country. This being said, Janet, <laughs> Europe was fantastic on Ukraine against Russia. I mean, they've been in foreign affairs. Mm. Great improvement. So I don't think it's that bad yet. Now, Bill, particularly the role of Russia in the last year I and mean, where it's now placing itself. Well, I really wanted to go back to the Cuba deal. Oh, OK, I, go back I, to I, Cuba. <laughs> yeah, I think I really believe it's a, it's a real breakthrough. I mean, I agree with ja Janet when she says that it was all designed for Obama to leave his mark on history, having failed to address all the major issues he came to sort, mm -hmm. uh, including the Middle East. I think we've all viewed, you know, the island as a shorthand for East-West disharmony over the years, especially since the uh, Cuban uh, missile crisis in 1962. But to me, it's like the falling of the Berlin Wall. It's just a sign symbolic sign that things can change and they can change very quickly. And I think it's the Brazilian president who called it a civiliz civilizational change. And um, but communism hasn't collapsed. Um, it's not like the it's not like the fall of the wall. As far as the Cubans are concerned, they are not free to leave. The Berlin Wall is still there. They are prisoners on that island. No, but, but what do you want? A regime change. We don't want that. We have tried that no, in no, the no. Middle East. But I mean, Look what, what did he accomplish? You well, know, he's he, allowed a few rich, influential people in Cuba to trade and become richer. No, and the people will live better because they won't be that As far as his own embargo. legacy is concerned, and as far as, you know, from his own point of view, that's a, a major thing to achieve without, before leaving the White House. I think it's designed for his own legacy yeah. rather than yeah, for absolutely. practical changes between, uh, in the relation between mm. the two countries. Really. And Vietnam and China show that communism can also be a system which in the third world could manage some things. Not well, only you have this view that it's all uh, USSR. It's not China, that at all. China remain, isn't a communist country any longer. It's, well, a, it it's, a, capitalist, no, 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 it's a capitalist country. It's but it's, a, but it's a tyranny still. It has mm. a terrible human rights record. So now we have a capitalist tyranny instead of a communist tyranny. And that's what you're going to end up with in Cuba. A, so it, when, you look at, when you look then back at 2014 and with these particular areas of the world and the shifts that have been made, what do you take from it? Another bad year. I yeah. mean, there have been, of course, some, you know, some, some things have moved forward, but these are very difficult times. Uh, economically, they're, they remain very difficult. And politically, uh, it's, it's, it's quite bad. And I think the isolation of Russia is going to, it's going to make a big difference down the road. And I thought 2014 will be the year of <laughs> Africa, and then we had Ebola. Yeah. So whatever way you turn, it was a bad year. If you look at uh, the political or geopolitical landscape then between, particularly looking out from Europe, Mark, um, what are the main dangers you think that have come during this past year? Oh, I think for, for Europe it's obviously uh, the Russian situation mm -hmm. because it's threatening our rapprochement with Ukraine, it's threatening the cohesion in foreign policy, but we went through it. We sanctioned Russia and the regime in Russia, Putin, is suffering because of it. Not mm. bad. And Janet, how has the world dealt with all of this? Chaos. Chaos. I mean, the, the, there's a, everybody's foreign policy is a shambles. Nobody knows suddenly that all the parameters have changed and nobody's devised a policy to deal with this. Uh, and, and the economy is going into the tank, the European economy, even the German economy is slowing down. Um, and the American economy is recovering, but they, they're, they're becoming more isolationist. Uh, it's, it's really very, very difficult to see what the happy ending is going to be. Well, on that pessimistic note, we, we have a few moments left, so I'd like to go around the table and get your, your, I mean, your, perhaps your abiding memory from 2014, if you, if you can choose one, Nabila. Well, I'll go back to the World Cup and to the, I mean, being of Algerian background, it was delightful to see how the Algerian team performed during the World Cup at a time when, you know, the Middle East 
was in uh, going through several crises. So it, it was a, an excuse for the people around the Arab world, especially to, you know, mm. get a bit of, uh, introduce a bit of joy and, you know, into their lives. I think that was a, a tremendous moment. Okay. Stryker? I guess I would have to say uh, the IS flag, just that, that very nihilistic, N nasty looking black and white flag and not and not even to mention the videos that mm. that we all saw or heard about uh, but that would be that would be that memory okay mark oh for me it's the affair of the french president <laughs> and the publication <laughs> of the books and pictures that's the great time of the year french files well i suppose it distracted you from everything else yes. absolutely <laughs> gave a bit, a bit of, of comic relief, relief. <laughs> yes Shannon. I, I think Russia and the Ukraine, I think that the, the shooting down of that airliner, which seemed to me like the sinking of the Lusitania, and I mm. could not understand why that didn't have more of an impact on the policy of the West. That was outrageous. And the fact that Russia actually got away with that uh, just struck me as grotesque. Mm. Final thought, Nabila? Well, my final thought would be really to have some sort of peace in the Middle East. I think to resolve the Israeli-Palestinian conflict would be essential to bring about peace in the whole region. Mm. And I think the role of social media this summer and the role of traditional media, 24 news hour coverage, really show that you know Israel was able to get away with lethal campaigns in the past. Those days are clearly over, and people are, you know, becoming more aware of this um, okay. uh, injustice. Really. Okay. I want to thank all of you for being our guests, both today and, of course, through the year as well. Um, next week, of course, we'll be looking ahead rather than looking back. But Sean Lay will be here in the chair to take you through all of that. Uh, from all of us, though, have a very happy new year. Bye bye.